O oh God, our Maker and Redeemer, you wonderfully created us, and in the incarnation of your Son, yet more wondrously restored our human nature. Grant that we may ever be alive in him who made himself to be like us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, we started talking about the Apostles' Creed. Um, I think you should have gone through the first article. So today we're going to start with the second article. Um, let's say the first article together. I won't make you do the meeting. Right? Ready? I believe God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. Okay, that's it. Um, who are we talking about here? God, God the Father, Father Almighty, who is also Maker of heaven and earth. Another name for Maker. Creator. Creator. Thank you. Creator. Creator. So, first article. God. Creator. Second article. Let's just say the first line. And in Jesus Christ. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Born of the Virgin Mary. Okay, stop there. Thank you. Who are we talking about? Jesus Christ. Born Jesus Christ. Christ. Yeah. Conceived by the Holy Spirit. Second article. Jesus, who is also called. We're going to say Redeemer, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. In the third article. I believe in the... Okay, that's enough. It was also called the Sanctifier. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Alright, so we have three articles, right? Mm -hmm. First one talks about... Second, Jesus. Third, Holy Spirit. Okay, who do we say the Trinity is? Jesus or God. Yeah. Yeah. Who? Who's in the Trinity? Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Many times when we're talking about the Trinity, we'll refer to the first person, the second person, the third person, and it goes in that order: God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Which is also how our creed, how Luther divided up our Apostles' Creed. One, two, three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, so that it goes in the order of the person of the Trinity. So today we are talking about the second person of the, tr person of the Trinity, who is? Second person of the Trinity, who is? Jesus. Jesus, right. Okay. A Redeemer, what does redeem mean? Um, What do we do with a what do we do with a coupon or a coupon, however you? Who says coupon? Who says coupon? One. Maggie Racer, you say you say you be proud. And who says coupon? Okay, I'm just I'm just wondering. All right, so we we redeem. You've ever, you've heard you redeem a, a coupon or a, I'm going to go with the majority. You redeem a coupon, right? Redeem. It means kind of like to pay off or to buy back which is what Jesus did for us, right? When he died on the cross and rose again, he claimed us back as his own. He claimed us from death. And that's why he's called the Redeemer, right? Does anybody know what sanctify means? We call the Holy Spirit the sanctify, sanctifier. <clears throat> what does sanctify mean? Have you heard the word before? Sanctify. Yes? Okay. It means to be, to be like God, to be made holy. And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. And he works through the Word of God, so the Bible, the Scripture, and he works through the sacraments, baptism and uh, communion. So by reading or by hearing the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is active in you, strengthening your faith, 
when you receive communion, he is at work in you, strengthening your faith, and also when you are baptized. So that's what sanctifier is. All right. So back to the first article, which is about who? God the Father. God the Father. The Creator. Why did He, why did he create us? So we could prosper. Okay. What else? What, what, why do you think He created, I mean, did He have to? He didn't have to. Why did He create us? Because he, he was lonely, he wanted some people to hang around with. Why do you why do you think he created us? Samantha had the question that we remember when we were at South Dakota, and you asked the question, well, "Why God? Why did God create us?" And we talked a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. You know, think about the conversations that we had that day. Now, I'm not trying to put Samantha was the one that asked, but we talked about it as a group. You know, think of why did God create you? I'll give you a hint. It wasn't to it wasn't to do things for him. It wasn't to serve him. He doesn't need us to do anything for him. For love. Exactly, because he loves us, and he knew us before creation. That is why God created us. Okay. So for today's lesson, the second article, which is about who? God, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> All right. Who's Jesus? The Redeemer, sent to earth, God in, in the flesh, second person of the Trinity. Why did God send His only Son to earth? To save us from our sins. Exactly. And why? So we could go to heaven. Why? You're right, but keep going. You're going. He loves us, exactly, for the exact same reason He created us. He sent Jesus to save us because He loves us. So do you see a theme going here? God loves us. Okay, that's what we're getting at. All right, that brings us up to today, and we're going to talk about the second article, just that first line which you, you all recited. That's what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to be looking in Luke. But first I want to talk a little bit about memorizing, which you all love. Does anyone love to memorize? Do you enjoy memorizing? Do you really? You're lying to me. <laughs> I don't like it. I, I really don't like it, but I have to do a lot of it. Um, it's an important component to a confirmation class, but not only to confirmation class, but to the entire life of a Christian. And why do you think that is? Why is memorizing important? So if someone asks you, you can tell them? Mm -hmm. Right? We want, we want the Word of God to be a part of us. Who plays sports? Any kind of sport. Who's in music or theater? Anything like that. When you're in sports, um, when you're in football, I'm more familiar with football, so we'll go with that. When you're in fo football, how do, you know what to, how do you know what direction to run? How do you know what to do when you're out on the field? You just... Because you'll be pointed that way. You just decide on your own? No. When you're on the basketball court, how do, you know, how do you know when to cut and when to pick? Because it's part of, part of the play. So when you're in sports, you learn plays, right? So that way, when you're in the situation, you don't have to think. The coach yells out a play such as... Wisconsin. Wisconsin. As soon as he says Wisconsin, you should know what to do, right? You go to your spots, you, you do your assignment. When you're on the football field, when they tell you the, the whatever the play is, you know, you know what way the... the, the the linebacker is coming through, you know what route the, the uh, receiver is going to run and so forth. You know what count the, the, the snap is on. Because you study these plays over and over and over and over. You take home playbooks and you study them over and over and over. So that when you're in the situation and they call out Wisconsin, you know exactly what to do without thinking. Memorizing is the same thing. We memorize scripture so that we, when we are in a situation where we have to make a decision... The right answer pops into our head. Like you said, when someone comes up to you, when a friend comes up to you and is having problems and asks you, knowing that you're a Christian, and this will happen to you, I don't care where you are, people will know you are a Christian and they will come up to you with problems. Many times a non-believer. And what we want popping into your head 
is the word of God, because that's the right answer, right? Mm -hmm. So this is why we memorize. It's not to torture you. It's not to build character. It is so that you have the answer when you're faced with the situation. All right. No opening your books or looking in your books. Anybody I see looking in their books right now will get enough for the day. You really will. Um, I want you to pair up. So you two, you two, just pair up around the room. You two together. You go with these two here, okay? Get out a piece of paper. This is a group project within your pair or your trio there. Did you say Okay, don't use your work. Just on a separate piece. Of paper. You just need one piece of paper per group. So you can you can collaborate. You can help each other. So move close to each other. Now, without looking in a book or anywhere else with the answer, like I said, you can quietly discuss it between the two of you. Write down the first part of the second article, which is what we just recited. Wait, uh, not what does this mean? Not yet. <laughs> so just the first part, ending with the word Mary. So when you get to the word Mary, stop. That's all you have to do. It's not even the whole second article. So second article. And you have five minutes. So discuss it. Unless one of you knows it perfectly, then you can just write it down. I'm, I'm giving you that much cheating room as you can talk to each other. So what's the second article? Jesus. We're going to work on memorizing a little, memorization a little bit today and different ways of doing it because it's a challenge for me and I'm sure it's a challenge for some of you. Um, and I'll give you a hint. We're going to end the class in the same way that we're beginning it right here. So, kind of the same way. So, what, everybody stand up. What are some of the tricks of memorizing that some of you use? What helps you? Sing it. Sing it, okay. Really? Well, that is a way to do it, though. Some people make songs out of it, uh, absolutely. Read it. Yeah. Read it over and over, over, and, over and over and over. I yeah. Walk on it. Write it over and over. Write it over and over and over. Okay, what else? Speak it over and over and over. Read it over and over and over. A lot of times I'll use hand gestures to help me remember certain things or I'll emphasize certain words. I'll try to set it up in some sort of a rhythm. Now the catechism divides it up already, but you can divide it up even more. So, we're going to work on what I just had you try to write down. Well, just a little bit. That's not our whole lesson today, but I just want to work on it. So, the, uh, the, the second article, let's say together, By the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. That's all I want. Okay? And in Jesus Christ, this is the second article, who is the what person of the Trinity? Second, second article, second person. So we know we're talking about Jesus. And these are all tricks you use to memorize. Okay? Second article, second person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son. Okay, Jesus. That's one way to help jog your memory. We're talking about Jesus. And in Jesus Christ, His only Son, His only Son, our Lord, I have one finger up, only one finger up, pointing up at God, right? His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Okay? We got the first part okay. Um, now, the, the what does this mean? Again, it starts with I believe, which many of them do. Who are we talking about? Second article? Second person. Who is? Jesus. So, wow. what does this mean? I believe in Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Stop there because you all wrote down the Redeemer and that's not part of it. True God. True God. Right. You got it now, don't you? It, it, it popped into your head. I believe that Jesus Christ. True God, begotten of the Father from eternity, so that's his God presence. And also, he was God and Son. 
Man. And also true man, born of who? The Virgin Mary, is my Lord. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord. And I'm in between I believe Jesus Christ and is my Lord is a description of who he is. It describes God, Jesus as God, and then Jesus as man. So this is how you kind of break this down, and it helps you helps you learn it and understand it, but it also helps you to recite it and memorize it when you can think, okay, second article, second person of the Trinity. I mean, we all say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Son, second, okay. Um, I believe in Jesus Christ. What is he? He's true God. Begotten, and we'll talk about that word in a little bit. Begotten of the Father from eternity, and true man. Where did he come from? Virgin Mary. Born of the Virgin Mary is my Lord. So let's say that together. We start with I believe. I believe. Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ. And he is true. True God. Begotten. Of the Father. Father. From where? From he No, that's the man. From Eternity. And what else is he? True man. Where did he come from? Born of the Virgin Mary. We'll do the, virgin, the pregnancy belly here to remember that. Born of the Virgin Mary is who? Is my Lord. Let's do it again. What does this mean? Yeah? Yeah? Come on. Gotten of the from and who else? True man. Yeah? From where? Is who? Is my Okay, very good. One more time. Run it. Come on. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, we gotta see who he is first. Yeah? From? Yeah, and who else is he? True man. Yeah? Born. 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 These are vocabulary words that we find in the second article, and we also find in scripture our, our scripture reading for today, which is from Luke 1. So let's go through these terms. First one, Son of God. Who's that? Okay, write that down. Does he have a name? On your worksheet where it's under... Oh, I gave you most of the answer. Okay. Well, good for me. All right. Well, then we'll just fill in the blanks. So, the second person of the Holy Trinity. So that's your first two lines. Mm -hmm. I think we have that established. Who in eternal love and union with who? The Father. and the Holy Spirit, so we got the Trinity there, he's in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit, we're talking about Jesus here, is one God and one Lord, and who became man, man. or you can put in flesh, a lot of times it's referred to as flesh, either one, you'll hear both, in order to suffer and die for the Sin. sins of the world. world, that's the first one. All right, we can understand that. But the second one, only begotten. We use that word, right? Begotten from the who? From? There you go. Begotten of the Father from eternity. So what does begotten mean? That means he's unique. He's one of a kind. And this is beyond our understanding as sinful human beings, but he's generated from the Father. But yet he's not created. He always existed, but he, he's generated from the Father. When you beget somebody, um, that means you, you father them. But he's not created like we were. Jesus has always been there. 
So that's what begotten means. Emanating from the Father, but has always been there. Okay? So, only begotten. The eternal, you can fill in unique, the word unique there, one of a kind. Sharing of the Father's essence with the Son. Incarnation. The Incarnation, you'll hear that word many times if you haven't already. The Son of God took on, what did he do when he came to earth? Who did he become? Human. Yeah. Human? Right, right. He became human, like I said, flesh. Um, so what you could put in there, you can put, a, he took on human flesh. But he became a human, he became man. Well, actually, that's the, that's the next point. He became man. In his conception. So that, so that there is a union of the divine person, of the Son of God. With the human nature. So you, hear, you, you always hear that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. Which is why in the meaning that we just said, we talk about true God, begotten of the Father, and true man, born of the Virgin Mary, right? So it's these two unions that come together. God and man come together when Jesus Christ comes to earth. They're separate, but they're the same. Again, it's, it's, it's they call the second greatest mystery. The first greatest mystery that we don't understand is the Trinity. It's beyond our comprehension as, as sinful human beings. And then the second greatest mystery, they say, is, is this dual person of God and man through Jesus Christ. We don't understand it. It's like the Trinity. It's two persons, but they're one. Jesus Christ. The virgin birth. That the Son of God was both conceived, which is in our meaning, in our, what does this mean? Conceived by the Holy Spirit, or in the, in the article, and born of what kind of flesh? Virgin. Human. Human. Oh, put in Mary's there. Put in Mary's flesh. Born of Mary's flesh. Without the aid of a man. In order that he might be like who? God. No. Jesus Christ the man wanted to be like us. us. That's why he came to earth. One of the reasons. In every way except... So he is like us in every single way except what? Sin. He didn't sin, right. So without sin. Now... A virgin birth is interesting, and I was thinking about this this morning. Um, there was no man involved, right? There's no dad, except God the Father. Joseph, we know, was his earthly dad, um, but he had no part in it, other than marrying um, Jesus' mother Mary. You see, when Jesus came to earth, it had to be a complete gift. Just like our faith is a complete gift from God, nothing we can do can save us, right? We preach that over and over and over again. Faith is a complete gift of God. So Jesus coming to earth had to be a complete gift. And if it would have required a man like traditional parenthood, like everyone else has to do, um, then that means we would have had to take part in Jesus coming to earth. It would have been us that had to bring him here. And that's not the way God works. It is a total gift. So this is why she, she was a virgin and, and it didn't involve a human, a human father. Alright. The two natures of Christ. That the Son of God, since His incarnation is true God and true hmm? man in one person is what we call it. He's He's God and man at the exact same time in one person. The humiliation of Christ. That the Son of God kept His divine majesty, the meaning He kept His godliness, His divine majesty, hidden as an obedient servant 
He submitted, it, he submitted himself to every human limitation in a fallen world. So what the humiliation is, is that God, when he became man, he was still God, right? So he could have done whatever he wanted to, um, but he didn't. He limited his powers here on earth when he was a man so that he could live a human life and that he could be an example and we could look to him as an example because he led a human life. So the godly stuff for a lot of his ministry, and he did let it, he did let it, he did reveal it every once in a while with his miracles and so forth, but for the most part he lived a, a perfect human life. Emmanuel, you've heard that word before. The Old Testament name for the Son of God, that means God with us. Yep. Which refers to his incarnation, which is him coming in the flesh and his virgin, the, the virgin birth. All right, last one, Messiah. The title given to who? Jesus. Jesus. That means anointed. Jesus the anointed. One. one. Yep. He was the fulfiller of the entire Old Testament. When, when Jesus is on the road, road to Emmaus with the two disciples, and they're all messed up because their Savior died, and Jesus is walking with them, and he, they don't know that he's Jesus, but Jesus starts explaining all of Scripture to him, which is the entire Old Testament, and how all of it points to Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Now, the Old Testament was finished 450 years before Jesus was ever born. All right? So, there is over 300 prophecies of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, which was finished 450 years before he was born. Twice the age of the United States. Before he was born. Over 300 prophecies that have been fulfilled in one person, Jesus Christ. This is impossible, unless you are God. There was a... And you've maybe heard this before, there was a mathematician that did the odds, and I forget if it's 1 in 10 to the whatever power. But what they said was, you could cover the entire state of Texas in quarters. Coins. Put a little red X on one of them. Cover the entire state of Texas one foot deep in quarters. Now blindfold yourself, start walking wherever you want in the state of Texas, reach down and pick up a coin. And if you find the one in the X, that's as much of a chance as there is that one man would have fulfilled 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. It could only be by God. And these are proven. We rely on the Word of God through faith. We take it through faith as being error-free and the Word of God, the inspired Word of God. But there's a lot of science that backs up our faith. Our foundation is in our faith, but it's, it's, it's interesting to use science to back these things up. And these things are recorded. In, in a lot of pagan literature, not even Christians wrote about these things. In archaeology, all of these things. So, anyways. I got off on a tangent. But he fulfilled the entire Old, Te Old Testament, and that's what Messiah is. Alright, stand up again. Second article. Recite it. Just that first line that we worked on. And Jesus Christ, the Son of our Lord, was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Stop. Oh no, wait, one more. Thank you. Stop. Alright, what does this mean? Turn to Luke 1. We gotta hurry because I thought we Luke 1, verses 26 to 
would like to start reading? Read one verse. Um, not go through 30. So, yeah, 26 to 30. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel, Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly, greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But, an angel, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Okay, someone 31 to 34. Who would like to read that? Yep. Um, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I'm a virgin? All right, 35 to 38, who would like to read that? Sure. Thank you. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. All right, so how did the angel Gabriel greet the Virgin Mary? Well, what do you say? Greetings. Greetings. Most highly favored one. Greetings, most highly favored one, or oh favored one, or depending on what title you have. What does it mean to be highly favored when an angel says to you, greetings, highly favored one? Obviously, that's a positive thing. Huh? God loves you a lot. Yeah. God loves you a lot. God chose you to do something. That's number two. Why do you think Mary was afraid? Because she didn't know what this meant. She didn't know what this meant? True. That, that's one of the big reasons. She wasn't sure what this all meant. Why else? You're sit, if you're sitting at home in the living room and all of a sudden this this body, this 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 being materializes right in front of you, would that startle you just a little bit? Okay. So there's physical reasons. There was there was emotional reasons. There was all kinds of reasons. This thing appears to her and starts telling her you're favored and, and God wants you to do something. So she she started off uh, pretty scared. Now why why did the angel say? Or what did the angel say to uh, get rid of Mary's fear? Do not, Do not be afraid. Which pretty straightforward. <laughs> it seems kind of obvious, but coming from an angel, now by now she knows it's an angel, and she's giving a message from, and he's giving her a message from God, and he's encouraging her that no, you found favor with God. God is going to do something great with you. So her fear starts going down. <clears throat> And that's why she shouldn't be afraid. Because this is a message from God. This is a total gift from God that the angel came to her and wants her to do something. So that's number five. It's a gift from God. Wait, that was number five? That was number five. It's a gift from God. And we're zipping through these because we're running out of time. Number six, what did the angel announce concerning Mary? What did he tell her she was going to be doing? Have a baby. Child. Yeah, you're going to have a baby. You're going to call him Jesus. Son of the Most High. 
Lord, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign in the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. That's quite an announcement. So who was conceived of Mary's flesh? Huh? What was seven? Who? What was seven? Oh, what was seven? Who was conceived? That's what I'm asking. Who was conceived of Mary's flesh? That's eight. That's eight? Yep. Oh, my numbers are messed up. All right. Let's go to number eight then. Who was conceived of Mary's flesh? Jesus. Jesus. And then uh, back to number seven, which is my number eight. Um, what should the child be called? First answer is the same. Yes. Yeah, there you go. What else? Son of the Most High. Holy One. Holy One. Sure. All these things. There's a lot of different names, especially uh, through Scripture that are that are used for Jesus. All right. Number nine. What does this birth, birth mean for all men, women, and children who suffer under the curse of the fall? Who in here suffers under the curse of the fall? Right. We're all sinful. Exactly. So what does the birth of Jesus mean for all of us? We get to go to heaven. We are saved, we get to go to heaven. Sure. And then uh, number 10. How does Mary's word to the angel exemplify the confession of every Christian? Okay. Um, in verse 38. Read, someone read verse 38 real quick. Go ahead, Michael. Let's read it. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Okay. And I already filled that one in for you, I believe. So, the way Mary responded to the call of the Lord is the way we should respond every time the Lord calls us. Now, we're not going to have an angel appear in front of us, most likely. I'm not going to limit God. It might happen. I don't know. Chances are it won't. But something is going to enter your heart. There's someone you can help or whatever. This is the call of God. There's someone lonely over there that you know needs to talk to somebody, and instead of walking that way, the call of God says that you walk that way towards them and you talk to them, and you share the good news of Jesus Christ with them and the love of God. These are all calls to serve in your church, to serve in the community. Um, somebody needs, some elderly person needs their, lake, their, their lawn raked. That's God calling you, just like he called Mary into service. And when we're called into service by God, we respond the same way that Mary does. We may not understand why or how. Believe me, I never understood why I was being called into the ministry. But you answer the call, having faith in God that it is for the good of those who love him. Okay? So real quick, we have a minute left. On the back of your worksheet, do not get together as partners, but write down that first line of the second article, up to the word Mary, and then what does this mean up to the word Lord? Second article and in Jesus Christ. That's the hint I'll give you for that. <laughs> 